Hi, my name is Joshua, and I'm going to be talking today about doing continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, using Zool and Kubernetes primarily for Yocto project things. That's a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been working at Garmin since 2009, and we've been using Open Embedded and the Yocto project since about 2016. You can see my email addresses, uh, IRC handle, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of that stuff if you would like to contact me. All right, so I'm gonna give a little introduction and background before we get started. So this is very much a continuation of my 2021 ELC presentation, which goes into uh, specifically Kubernetes uh, for Yocto builds uh, much more in depth. Uh, so I'd highly recommend you look at that if that's something you're interested in. But to give a little bit of background, sort of the idea is that uh, when you're doing Yocto builds and things like that, you, you have your things that you want to build, which you might build in like a crops container or something like that. And then you might want to test that on hardware using something like LabGrid, which is what I'm using. And so that's kind of your core build pipeline. But you also need a lot of these ancillary services that kind of go with that. So you need an S-state uh, cache, you need a hash equivalent server, you need a PR server, you need a NFS cache, or download cache, and you need to export those caches over HTTP so that your uh, other developers can uh, pull from those caches as a mirror. And so a lot of these ancillary services kind of make a lot of sense and fit well uh, with Kubernetes because you can spin these up as basically microservices that go along with your builds. So if we can do our builds and all of our ancillary services and Kubernetes, it can kind of make it easier to manage uh, that regard. So in my previous talk, I did all of this with uh, Tecton uh, using that's kind of a web native uh, thing. But uh, for this one, I'm going to talk about doing basically the exact same thing using Zool. So the way this kind of works is we will ingest some code from uh, Metafosh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and then we're going to build it in a crops container, uh, test it on actual hardware using LabGrid and PyTest, uh, which is going to talk to a computer sitting under my desk running my LabGrid cluster on actual hardware. Uh, and this is all kind of managed by Zool. Uh, so that, uh, sorry, so that gives you a lot of uh, advantages of running all this stuff in Kubernetes. You kind of get a lot of the high availability and the scalability that uh, Kubernetes offers you uh, just because it's designed to do those kinds of things. Um, and so that's why we want to do that. All right, so what is Zool? So uh, Zool is a open source project that's primarily developed by OpenStack, although I think there's a bunch of other people involved in it. Uh, and it is actually designed from the uh, ground up to be high availability and scalability. So it pairs pretty well with Kubernetes. And it has a highly flexible configuration. So you can do all kinds of different things with it, uh, which is really awesome. It does mean that it requires a little bit of configuration to get it up and running the first time, uh, which Took me a little while to figure out because I wasn't used to it. Uh, and they have really good documentation. I would highly recommend going and looking at their website if you're curious about the things Zool can do in general. Zool is actually not one thing. It's actually a whole bunch of different small components that all work together in order to do uh, the continuous integration and continuous delivery stuff. Um, and so this actually is why they have such good high availability and scalability because you can simply spin up multiple of these components and then you get the redundancy in case one goes down, it will keep, keep going along. Or if you need more capacity for something, you can simply scale up multiple of these components and then it will load balance between them. Uh, so you can set all this up. Uh, you know, on your own with all these different components on discrete hardware or whatever you want. Uh, but I, it, that's a lot of stuff to set up. And fortunately, since I'm using Kubernetes, there's actually this thing called the Zool operator, which you can uh, put on your Kubernetes cluster. And then you make a component that is a Zool and say how many of these different components you want running. And it will just make sure they're all up and running in that number, uh, restart them if they go down, you know, whatever. So that makes this much easier. All you have to do is create a Zool, provide some of the configuration, and you're up and running on your Kubernetes cluster. Zool supports a bunch of different platforms. There's kind of two different components to the things it can support. So it can uh, pull source code. Uh, 
uh, from a bunch of different locations. And then it can also build on a bunch of different backends, which is how it actually does your builds. So as far as the source drivers are concerned, uh, they have really good Garrett support because uh, that's what OpenStack uses is Garrett, uh, but also has a uh, good uh, GitHub and GitLab support. Um, and then you can also do things like timers and things like that, like cron jobs, if you want to do scheduled builds and things. Um, it also has a bare like Git repository driver where you can do builds based on just a random Git repo uh, triggers from like a random Git repo, like a tag or a, a branch moving or something like that. And as far as where you can build your code, uh, there's a couple of different options. Uh, Kubernetes pods is the one that I'll be using today because I have a Kubernetes cluster, uh, but it also supports uh, the major cloud providers, AWS, Google, and Azure. Uh, and obviously, since it's developed by OpenStack, it also has support for OpenStack, so you can have it just spin up OpenStack VMs to do your builds on. And it also supports uh, static build nodes if you just have a static build farm. Uh, so Zool has a couple of different configuration things that they uh, that, that you have to configure. Uh, so the first one that we'll talk about is uh, what's called a pipeline. And this really defines when you're going to build something and what you're going to do when that build is done. So uh, this would be, so the triggers could be like when a branch head changes, when a pull request is opened, um, you know, when a tag is dropped or something like that. Uh, and so your pipelines define what, uh, when you're going to build something. And then you also say what you want to have happen when that build is finished. So that can be leave a comment on the pull request or you know merge the pull request into the uh, destination branch uh, or you know lots of different things like that. Um, these are all defined using YAML files and uh, you put these in what they call a trusted configuration Git repo. Um, they kind of split up the configuration between trusted and untrusted uh, so that you can have trusted configuration that you kind of don't let just anyone modify uh, so that you can kind of have your security domains and kind of do uh, secure builds. And then you have uh, untrusted code that kind of could be stuff from random repositories that people might change. Uh, so it kind of lets you divide up your configuration like that so that you can do builds more securely. Uh, and we can take a look at uh, my configuration here. Um, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but you can see I've got some uh, pipelines set up to do like a check pipeline and a, a gate pipeline. And these are all the triggers and things that you do when you're done, um, which I'm not gonna go into this. You can read about that in the documentation. Oops, wrong one. All right, so then the other thing uh, that you have with Zool configuration is what they call a project. And this is basically what you're going to build, the source code that you're going to build. You define this also with uh, YAML files. Usually this lives inside the repository with the source code and you point Zool at that repository and it will scan these YAML files every time uh, a branch head changes basically to figure out, you know, what you're going to be building from that repository, but you can also put them independently in a trusted Git repository um, if you want to build code that's basically completely unaware of Zool. So if you don't want to put all the Zool configuration in a repository, you can put it in a trusted Git repo too. And the final thing uh, is a job, which is how you build something. Uh, these are again defined with YAML files that usually live in the repository with the source code, uh, but they don't have to. Uh, you can actually create common libraries of functionality and share them between jobs. So this makes it really easy to make uh, like a library of common actions and things like that. And I've actually done that here or started to do that here with this uh, Yocto Zool jobs. Uh, I don't have a whole lot in there right now. It's mostly just lab grid stuff actually. Um, but you could just pull this in and you would be able to do a lot of the jobs that I'm doing uh, in this demonstration. Uh, the job supports some uh, an inheritance structure so that you can have jobs in one repository that you inherit in another repository and things like that. So it makes it easier to structure the jobs. Uh, and then the actual nuts and bolts of what you're building is defined using Ansible, um, oops, which, uh, 
is, is good in a lot of ways because it, it means that if you're familiar with Ansible, uh, you're pretty familiar with how Zool works. And then also the other thing that's cool about this is anything that Ansible can do, uh, Zool can do. And so you get the entire compendium of things Ansible is able to do, which is thousands and thousands of different things uh, automatically in Zool just by using uh, Ansible as the execution engine. Uh, so when Zool actually executes a job, it divides up the execution between two different uh, uh, build nodes. So the first thing that you have is you'll have a trusted Zool worker where there's a limited subset of things that can be executed. Uh, and then a worker will then uh, use uh, run Ansible to run untrusted stuff on a dedicated uh, builder node. So you might have multiple jobs running on the trusted worker node uh, that are that's using Ansible to build on each dedicated uh, builder. Uh, so in my case, these uh, Zool builders are um, Kubernetes pods that it spins up and down in order to do builds. Uh, and this allows you to really uh, sort of safely limit what type of untrusted job configuration you're executing. Um, so that that distinction is important to make sure that you're not executing random code that you don't want to be from like a pull request or something like that. Uh, something I don't really use much, but Zool is uh, pretty good at is cross project dependencies. Uh, so you can actually declare changes to be dependent on other changes uh, in other projects. So if you have uh, like uh, change A, in a repository and change B in another repository, you can mark change A as depending on change B. And Zool will actually test them together and then ensure that B is merged before it will merge A. Uh, and so this is really powerful. Um, a lot of people that do like Android development with repo really like this because just kind of the way repo works uh, fits really well with how this uh, ends up. You can make sure that those dependencies are declared uh, and that they operate correctly. So you're not breaking anything. Um, so like I said, Zool can be configured a whole bunch of different ways, but kind of the way that they really recommend you set it up is to do something called uh, project gating. Uh, and project gating is kind of a build philosophy where uh, your CI system uh, builds, tests, and merges uh, changes after they've been reviewed. Uh, so you don't have humans manually merging changes anymore. You let the build system do that for you. And there's a little bit more about this at that gating.web.dev website. Now, but the way I kind of like to think about it is if, if you look at the life cycle of a patch, um, project gating is really kind of designed to break up that patch life cycle with a really hard boundary between where the humans are involved and where the computers are involved. And the idea behind this is that you can play to the strengths of each side without having them really uh, conflict with each other or having to wait on each other for things to happen. Uh, so if you think about the life cycle of a patch, uh, there are things that humans are really good at, uh, like creativity and judgment calls and things like that. So like creating patches, you know, humans are really good at making patches and they're really good at doing code review on patches, uh, which computers generally aren't as good at. Um, and so what you want is at the beginning of the life cycle of the patch, you want the humans to basically be involved without much interaction from the machines. And once the humans are all done and they said, this patch is good, I want this patch to be merged, then it gets completely handed off to the computers and uh, they do the rest of the patch lifecycle management with no involvement from the humans. Um, and the reason for this is that computers are really good at the boring repetitive tasks that humans hate doing, like building code and testing code, and then finally merging the changes. And the building and testing is like pretty common for CI. Uh, the thing that gating really says does is says you need your computers to actually be merging the changes uh, so that the humans aren't coming back to do that later because that can basically introduce errors and you know dependencies on the on the CI process. Um, so you really want this hard handoff between when the humans are involved, when when the computers are involved. And obviously, like if the computer finds a problem building or testing something, it kicks it back to the humans for them to do their thing, right? Uh, so Zool kind of takes this one step further, and it does something called speculative execution. Um, and what it what this means is it actually looks at all of the changes that are, are to be gated, and it stacks them 
uh, in the order that it will finally merge them with their final SHA ones, and then tests them, uh, builds and tests them in that order. Uh, so it's doing this in situ, and basically once it's built and tests a change, it just fast forwards the branch head. And so this really reduces the ability, uh, really reduces the ability for a single change to uh, inadvertently break something by merging in a weird order with another change because it's testing them all in the order they're going to be merged with their final SHA ones. This also means that Zool can actually work ahead in this uh, gate in, in this stack of changes. So it might actually start testing changes from uh, you know, that are further down in the stack um, before the previous ones have finished, kind of with the assumption that they will pass. Um, and if they don't, then it's got to restack everything and start over. Um, <clears throat> so you can kind of see that here in this picture on the right, the change is actually stacked down. So you can see this, uh, like this 813419, that first green check mark, that one's not done. Uh, that, that will be the next change to merge, but it's not done. And so the changes further down in the stack are actually currently being built and that very bottom one, which is the most recent change, uh, is all done and passed, but it won't actually merge until the ones before it uh, pass or it has to restack or something like that. Uh, this also lets it optimize CI resources because it can be building ahead and using unused CI capacity to, te to test, uh, you know, uh, deeper into the stack instead of having to wait and test every change and wait for it uh, in cycle. Uh, and this is really important to reduce that uh, developer interaction with your merges. So, uh, you know, the, your developers can really hand off the changes and say, once this is ready to be merged, we can mark it however to be gated by Zool and it will merge eventually as long as there's not some problem with it. Uh, it might take a while if it's pretty deep in the, in the gate stack, but, it, you know, it will get there um, and the humans don't have to really worry about that at all. It's just it will merge when... Zool gets around to it. All right, so I'm going to talk specifically now about how we have you are using Zool and uh, Metafosh. Uh, so Metafosh is a layer for building a GNOME and Wayland based Fosh shell. I'm not going to go into this too much because Tim has an entire presentation on this later, um, but you can see the link there for the repository. Uh, so this is kind of the pro this is the project configuration for Metafosh. Um, so you can see we have the project here, and I have three pipelines defined: a check pipeline, a gate pipeline, and a periodic daily pipeline. Uh, and I will go into each of these in detail and kind of describe what they're for. Uh, so this first pipeline is the check pipeline. Uh, this is really intended to run basic sanity checks every time a pull request is created or updated. Uh, I currently have it actually building images uh, for QEMU and Raspberry Pi 4, but I'll probably end up changing this because you don't really want to be using CI resources to build, you know, every time a PR uh, pull request is updated. That's really the purpose of the gate job um, or the gate pipeline. Uh, so we can kind of take a look and see what this looks like here. And I'll go in and look at an actual specific build a little bit later. A lot of these uh, have actually been... Uh, uh, DQ'd um, because like I started a gate pipeline uh, because I was ready for the changes to merge while the check before the check pipeline finished. All right, so the next pipeline is the gate pipeline. This is really the nuts and bolts of stuff that gets done uh, in the repository here. Uh, and this is basically triggered when the gate label is placed on a pull request. And I'll explain why that is in a little bit. Um, but so the idea is once the once I've gone or whoever's in charge of the repository has gone and looked at the pull request and said, yes, this passes my code review, this is ready. Uh, they drop the gate label on that pull request. And then that tells Zool to take over and go ahead and build the change uh, and, and merge it. Um, and so it actually is going to build uh, QEMU uh, and Raspberry Pi 4 images, and then it will actually take those images and run them through a series of tests on LabGrid. And then once all of that has passed, it will merge the change into the repository. Uh, and so you can also take a look at this. This looks pretty similar. All of these pipeline uh, logs look pretty similar. And so you can see the changes that have been gated here. Uh, you can see the different pull request numbers. There's 16, 14, 13. Uh, so those are, have all been uh, 
gated into the repository and Zool merged them. And the final pipeline is the periodic daily pipeline. Um, so this I set up to run every night. And this basically the purpose of this is to build again QMU x86 and Raspberry Pi 4 images with the latest upstream layers. It again tests them on LabGrid. And then finally it uh, publishes those images for uh, users to download. So this is the primary way that you can get a build that I have done on my cluster and install it on your Raspberry Pi 4 to try it out. Uh, and so I'm not going to look at the pipeline logs because it looks basically the same, uh, but you can actually go here and you can download the latest daily builds. Um, I don't keep like a history of builds because I don't have enough disk space for that. So I just keep the most recent daily build. So you can actually go in here and download this if you want and uh, flash it onto your Raspberry Pi 4 and try it out. Uh, yeah, so here's an example of some build output. We can go look at that. Um, so uh, you can see these are the five jobs. So this is a daily build. So these are the five jobs that I've defined. So we've got the QMUX8664 build, and then this is the test that tests it with LabGrid, and then the same for the Raspberry Pi 4 and the test on LabGrid, and then this is the job that runs uh, at the end. Uh, to actually publish the images to the server so that you can go download them. Uh, and you, you can define dependencies between jobs to make sure that certain jobs run after other jobs. The ordering that you see here is not the order that they ran in. It's just arbitrary as far as I can tell. Um, so you can actually see here in the, in the timeline, you can see that the Raspberry Pi 4 and QEMU builds ran in parallel. And then once those were done, it started the test jobs for each of them. And those ran in parallel for a little bit. And then once everything was all done, then it ran the, the published job to publish it to the server. Uh, and so we can go take a look here at an actual build. And because this uses uh, Ansible, there's there's a lot of support for really rich, uh, you know, status reporting from a lot of these things. Um, so, you know, you can see all the Ansible stuff that's in here. Uh, you know, it's just a lot of information and a really good reporting on like what's going on in your build. And you can kind of break it up into pretty small tasks, which is also pretty nice. Um, so here you can see the actual build where we do we do the actual invocation of BitBake, and there's your standard log for that. Uh, and then another interesting one to look at is the uh, LabGrid tests. This LabGrid is awesome. So um, you know, in here we can see it actually running the test. So here's the LabGrid output. So we're testing that it. We're testing that the image boots. We're testing that we can SSH into it. Uh, we test that the phone compositor shell is running called FOC. We test that FOSH is running. Um, and we test this weak board is running, which is the on-screen keyboard. Um, and then I actually even have it set up here. So if you go to the logs tab, you can drill down in here and you can see the PyTest HTML output, which basically shows you the same thing uh, with a little more detail. So you can see all the command output and stuff from each test. All right, so, uh, you know, no CI project is, is without limitations. So I'll describe a few of them that I've encountered uh, when using Zool. Um, so the first one that really annoyed me was the gating trigger for GitHub. Um, using a label is kind of a weird thing to do, I think. Um, it would work a lot better if I could use the GitHub code review approval. Uh, so like when, when GitHub, you can do a code review and then you can say this, this is approved. Um, the huge problem with that is really a problem with GitHub and not Zool, which is GitHub will not let you self-approve a pull request. Um, so I don't really have any way to gate changes that I myself wrote. And since I'm, it's just me and, uh, Tim working in the repository, I really need to gate my own changes. I don't just want to merge them. I would rather much, much rather gate my own changes. Uh, so since I can't self-approve a PR that way, I have to use the label method. Um, uh, this works a lot better on GitLab because you can self-approve your own uh, changes with code review. And so you can just set it up to do that. Um, but that one really annoyed me. Uh, the other thing with Zool is uh, it, it's not really, easy to do like a manual trigger job. So in a lot of other CI systems, you can say like, I just want to build the code at this SHA-1, like go. 
Um, in Zool, you can do it in Zool, and I'll show you how, so I can show you an example of a live build. Um, but it's really more designed for these external triggers like uh, new pull request tags, push commits, a cron job, you know, whatever. It works really well for that. Um, but the manual build at a specific commit is a little bit tricky. Um, and kind of along with that, um, it, it really doesn't support what you would commonly think of as like build parameterization. So like if you've ever done Jenkins or anything like that, uh, you can go in and say, I just want to change these parameters for this one build that I'm doing. And Zool really doesn't support that. You really have to go in and change the, the, the metadata um, in like the YAML files and stuff to make the build do whatever you want. And then you need to make a new commit or something like that. And so you can't really do the like manual trigger job with build parameterization like you can do in some other build systems. Um, so if that's something you really, really, really need, um, which I think it could be argued about whether you, you really need that or not, but uh, I'll leave that to you. Um, you know, Zool is not gonna work the greatest for that. All right, so a couple things that we'd like to do uh, in the future, uh, just talking with Tim and I. So I'd really like to do some sort of world build and then publish those package feeds. I'm not sure how often to do this, maybe weekly. I don't know how long the builds would actually take, um, but I definitely need a more robust uh, hosting solution for that to work because I would not be able to host package feeds on my uh, cluster here in my basement. It doesn't have enough disk space and I don't have enough bandwidth for that type of thing. And I also need to start up a PR server. I don't currently have one, but I already have a hash equivalent server. So I don't think starting up a PR server would be terribly hard. Uh, another thing is uh, I'm, I'm currently just kind of uh, open coding the way to do the FOSH builds in uh, the Zool metadata. Um, but Tim added these cause files for uh, end users to do builds with. Um, and so there might be the option there of having a uh, Zool build using the cause files. And so we have a couple of advantages. One of the primary ones being that you could easily, I think, share that so that they, as like a library, as like a, a Zool um, job and the Zool job library so that it would be easy if someone else was running Zool and was using cause, they could just pull in that job and it would kind of just work. Um, and so that would make it really easy to share. Uh, some of the problems that uh, uh, kind of thought about with that is, uh, I'm already building in a container, so I, I don't want cause to also build in the container, which I think it is, is what it does by default. I'm not very familiar with cause, so I don't know if that's possible to change. Um, and then Zool actually, for all the repositories that you're watching, it actually keeps a, uh, it actually keeps a local cache of all those repositories. Uh, and it uses that so it can see like when things change in the repositories, like branch heads move or tags get added or whatever. Um, and so that allows it to do the cross project uh, dependency tracking. Uh, and it also means that when you do a build, it actually just copies that cache to the build node. So it really cuts down on the amount of cloning of Git repositories and all this other stuff that you're doing just to spin up a job. Um, and if you were to allow cause to download those layers and stuff, you kind of lose some of that unless there was a way to like better integrate it. Um, so if there was a way to like use the caches that uh, Zool already has and has put on the worker uh, and, and have cause pull those in, that would be, that'd be ideal. But I just haven't looked into it yet. Uh, and then the final one, which I actually started working on a little bit was like automatic recipe upgrades. So I'd like to, uh, uh, basically make it so that uh, like on my nightly build, Zool would go in and upgrade all the recipes in MetaFosh to their most recent versions. Um, and one of the nice things about the way that project gating works is you don't actually need Zool to do a build at that time, right? So if you can get Zool to make a commit on a branch that's uh, updates the recipes to all their latest versions, which only takes a couple minutes really to do all those checks, uh, then you can just gate that as normal. And that is actually the thing that does your testing of does this thing actually work and do all the things that you want. Um, and so I really like that because it means you don't have to go through the whole process of building all of it while you're doing the recipe upgrades. You can just gate it like a normal change. Um, and that would also test it on hardware, which would be pretty cool. Um, this is a little tricky with GitHub pull requests. Uh, if you've ever looked at the GitHub API, it's not the easiest thing to go in and say like, hey, I want to 
make a pull request <laughs> uh, programmatically. Um, so I'm, I'm working on it though. <laughs>